Hey, this is Trey. Thank you for joining us for another Tuesdays with Trey. Uh, We're grateful for your time. I have spent next to no time wondering what it would be like to still be in Congress. Like literally next to no time wondering what that would still be like. But I do have to confess, I regret not getting to serve with our guest today. His predecessor was a friend of mine, a guy named Judge Ted Poe. We served on judiciary together. He was someone I liked a lot, even though I was terrified of him. Uh, He had some health issues, which I found shocking because I figured even death was afraid of Ted Poe. The, The rest of us certainly were, but he decided to retire. And this young man in his 30s uh, ran in a pretty crowded field against some current elected officials, politicians in the great state of Texas, and he won. And chances are great. You know his name is Dan Crenshaw. So he went from really never having served in politics to becoming uh, something of a household name. And he joins us now. Welcome to you, Congressman. Great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Wish I could have served with you as well. Well, I uh, I would have loved that. Unfortunately, you were born like 30 or 40 years after I was. So we just kind of missed each other, at least in this iteration of life. Yeah, we did. Yeah. I want to ask you about the state of our country. But first, and, I, and my guess, if you're like everyone else I know that served in the military at a high level, you do not enjoy talking about yourself. But I can tell you the audience loves it when they get a sense of something about folks they know and see on television. So as uncomfortable as it is, I may ask you a few kind of biographical questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Born in Scotland, spent some time growing up in South America. I'm not going to hold you to remembering the details of your birth. You may not remember anything about Scotland, but what about South America and how did that help you uh, growing up in another culture? Sure. You know, I mean, so my dad worked in oil and gas. That's why uh, that's why we moved around the way we did. And um, <laughs> he gets some conspiracy theories online every once in a while. He's a dual citizen. He's part. He's British. It's like, no, I'm not. They don't They know it's not how it works. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't remember Scotland. We moved from there um, when I was a baby. Uh, my first memories are in Houston, grew up in uh, West of Houston and Katy. And um, then we moved overseas again to Ecuador in middle school, uh, back to Houston, and then overseas again for all of high school. So uh, this time to Colombia. And, you know, I have my 20 year high school reunion coming up in Colombia, in Bogota uh, this year, actually. So, I mean, it's um, it was great. I wouldn't trade my experiences for anything. Uh, I had a great time in high school. It was a dangerous time in Colombia. It was an interesting time. It was 1998 to 2002, which is uh the height of the the guerrilla war um you know 10 years before that well five to ten years before that were the heights of the the medellin cartel you know everybody's seen narcos by now so that's exactly what was happening in the early mid 90s and then um when pablo escobar fell that became a guerrilla warfare mostly outside the cities but still i mean you know there's places I, i i frequented quite often that were bombed so it's it's a little different of a high school experience our uh, car had been shot into um at one point i wasn't in it but my set mom was you know it, it was interesting but it was it was <laughs> i'm saying all the negatives there was many more positives than negatives that's for sure but um it, you know you couldn't travel from city to city so i never got to see the country very much i mean i it's not totally true i've been to quite a few places in colombia but not as much as i would have liked to and that's because you couldn't drive anywhere you get kidnapped uh, now it's very different. You know, after it really is a foreign policy success story for, for America in many ways. Colombia is one of our staunchest allies and best success stories um, where, you know, the right kind of American aid can really uh, turn a, a conflict ridden country into a, a pretty exceptional democracy and, and prime example of success. And um, there's an election coming up in Colombia that I'm a little worried about where they might reverse that and go to go to the ways of Venezuela. But Nevertheless, it's it's really amazing to go back to now and how much it's changed. So, look, what do you get out of this culturally? Well, you get a perspective, perspective on what is important and gratitude for the United States. That's for sure. Um, and you get a better perspective for other cultures, um, how to speak to other cultures, how to get along with them. You know, what are the dumb questions to ask and what are the right questions to ask? It's just it's very simple things. Um 
that I think have uh, served me pretty well. For those who may not know exactly what the congressman is talking about, um, uh, Narcos is uh, perhaps next to True Detective, my favorite miniseries. It is manifestly unfair to judge the country of Colombia based on Narcos or Mexico for that matter. But that was what was going on. And then he made reference to the FARC. So if you're not familiar with what uh, Colombia has overcome and to the congressman's point with uh, some help from the United States, uh, it might be worth looking into. Are you went to Tufts University? You minored in physics. And my question to you is why? Why would you pick a topic as hard as physics when you could major in English and there is no answer? <laughs> Good question. Like I. Uh couple of reasons. Um, liberal arts, I think, expand the mind, but but the but the sciences, math, uh, physics, it sharpens the mind. And, I, and having a mix of both, I think, is um, is very beneficial. I also had to take a bunch of physics and math classes already because of ROTC. So, you know, you add five more physics classes to that and boom, you got a minor. Now, I certainly I certainly hit my limit because uh, the last the last course I took was quantum mechanics. And um I find the field of quantum physics extremely interesting conceptually, but once you're in it, uh, you're really just doing math problems and, and improving theorems, which is, uh, that was when I was done. I was happy to be done at that point because that was not doing well. Uh, just doing, just doing this sort of advanced math, improving theorems. And I'm like, what, what is the point of this? Um, <laughs> I'll let the engineers take it from there. But, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. I think that was, uh, I think it was still the right choice, a little extra work, but, uh, what are you going to do? How often do you have a chance during late night vote series to sit by a colleague on the floor and talk about the string theory? Hmm. There might be somebody I could talk to <laughs> string theory, but I'm not sure I understand string theory very well. Um, <laughs> I've been trying to figure out exactly what it is. There's just like M theory, there's string theory, there's multiverse theory. Um, I listened when I was blind about a, back in April, um, you know, because my retina detached again. That was great. But it was actually kind of great because I just got to focus on things I was interested in instead of dealing with day to day politics every single moment, which have gotten just so freaking toxic and stupid that it's, it's, it's hard to fathom. But during that time, I was really able to detach and uh, <laughs> listen to this whole book on, uh, on a pretty prominent physicist arguing for multiverse theory. I don't buy into multiverse theory. It basically says that because the, the when, a, when, a, when a wave function collapses, it has these multiple probabilities associated with it. If, if you're familiar with Schrodinger's cat, it's this idea that the cat can be alive and dead at the same time. Of course, it can't, but it, but it can. And, and this is very confusing. Um, and so multiverse theory is, is the idea that uh, now Marvel has taken up, of course. right? That's how they're going to keep making movies is through multiverse theory. Um, this idea that these these wave functions do collapse into two separate uh, realities, and therefore there's this infinite amount of of universes, um, and it's uh, kind of mind blowing. I don't really like the theory myself. I prefer string theory, but even though I don't really understand it, <laughs> there was a movie with Denzel Washington uh, titled Deja Vu, uh, mm -hmm. and it talked about this multiverse: can you be dead and alive at the same time? That's all I know about it because I very much wanted the actress Paula Patton to be alive. Mm -hmm. And she was dead at the time. So that is the extent <laughs> of my knowledge of that. That and the guy in True Detective talking about time as a flat circle. That is the extent of my knowledge. But so, so physics, which for those of us that major in liberal arts is literally a foreign language. And then you decided, OK, what could be tougher than minoring in physics? Why don't I go to Bud's training? or what mm -hmm. people call SEAL training. So how in the world does this young man who grew up, born in Scotland, grew up in Ecuador and Colombia and Texas, which some of us consider a separate country, and Texas may consider itself mm -hmm. a separate country, minor in physics, and then you decide, okay, what else can I do? Why don't I go try out for the hardest thing in the world to get? Well, th so the, my first goal was to be a SEAL and, and you know, and then go to college, right? Like that was, that was, that was the order of, um, of thinking for me. And um, boy, I think I wanted that since I was 12 or 13, since I read uh, Dick Marcinko's book, R Rogue Warrior. God bless him. He just, he just uh, passed away uh, last month. So 
And he got a lot of us into the SEAL team. So those are the first sort of uh, viral books that, that were circulated and you know just told the adventures of, of Vietnam era SEALs, the, the formation of SEAL Team 6. Uh, a lot of guys in my generation grew up reading those books. And so that's where it came from. And it just, be, it's you know, everybody has this sort of childhood dream, like you want to be an astronaut or a firefighter or whatever it is, Navy SEAL, uh, spy. I think I, I think I went between spy and Navy SEAL occasionally, but, uh, you know, but I just happened to follow through with it. For the full podcast, go to foxnewspodcast.com.